Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Crossroads Evening Online Church. It's so good to have everyone here from Crossroads City, from Crossroads Lake G, our regular evening congregations, and for everyone who's visiting here as well, a really warm and mighty welcome to you all. My name is Ming. I'm one of the ministry apprentices right here at Crossroads, and it's so good to have you with us tonight. Well, in May, many of you kickstarted our newest congregation, that's Crossroads Lake G, and I've heard from some of you that it continues to grow from strength to strength. How amazing is that? And at City, we've also had quite a lot of new people, and yeah, it's just been growing, and there's been so many wonderful things that have been happening as well. Well, this evening, we come back together, Crossroads Lake G and Crossroads City, as one big and much bigger family than before. Last month, I was actually helping out at the Crossroads stall at the UC Market Day and heard that many people who came and stopped for a chat actually came along for the barbecue dinner and church at Lake G as well on the Sunday. Can I say that this and the many other things that I've been hearing and other people at City have been hearing as well have been such an encouragement to us as well. And yeah, we've been praying for you and for more people to be brought into the family. And at City, many of us have been seeking to know more people, whether it's workers getting to know students, students getting to know workers, people getting to know others outside their growth group, or people just getting to know all the new people that have been coming along. It's been really exciting stuff. And we've seen many new people as well. And if you're one of those new people joining us today, a special welcome again to you as well. We've definitely appreciated the prayers of our Lake G family at City for continued growth. And as we've been going through the same part of God's Word together, that's been such an encouragement as well. The fact that we've had so many new people of late is a testament to how we've been doing things at Crossroads as one big family. And at Crossroads, we want to see the news of Jesus producing more and more lifelong disciples who together see the gospel reach further and deeper into Canberra and beyond. But as a growing community in lockdown, let's continue to encourage and reach out to each other. During the week, uh, one, one of the people that I know uh, shared with me something really practical for us to be doing as well. Consider reaching out to a person, a different person that you know every day, and just check in with them, pray with them, and share with them something that, from God's word that you've been uh, yeah, just so encouraged by as well. And that's just one way that we can be loving and serving each other as well. Well, let's come now as a big family uh, before our God in prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are a God who is love and who understands us so well. Your steadfast love endures forever, and your mercies are new every morning. Help us, Lord, now to come before you as a united family that builds each other up and seeks your glory rather than our own. May you continue the good work that you have done in both our city and Lake G congregations, and may more people come to know and love you as we continue to meet together online. God, let us continue to come together to praise you and declare all the amazing things that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's continue now to praise our great God in song. So wherever you are, I encourage you to stand up and sing in his name. Release from 
for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praises. We might not yet have a thousand people across our city and Lake G evening congregations, but it would have been so great to be joining together in song with you all uh, from in front of the device you are watching this on as we praise God together. And so, how good it is to see Chad and Rachel from our Lake G congregations as well. Chad, congrats on your wedding and Rachel, congrats on your baby as well. Well, if you've only just come online, a big welcome to you again. My name is Ming, and it's so good to be having you with us tonight. Well, um, it's fair to say a lot of things have happened this week that would make us lose hope. We've heard the terrible news of the unfolding situation in Afghanistan as the Taliban remain, regained full control of Afghanistan. The situation for Christians there that was already tenuous at best has gone from bad to worse. And we've witnessed the growing number of COVID cases here in Canberra and yeah, just the number of cases skyrocketing as well in nearby Sydney and in other parts of the world as well where many of us have loved ones or friends as well. And I know for many of you, it might've been a struggle this week just to get through regular lockdown, let alone for some of us who have been stuck in quarantine as well, unable to get out. Um, and my heart really feels uh, and goes out to you all as well. Well, when Moses summoned Joshua as the people of Israel were gathered on the cusp of the promised land after wandering around in the desert for 40 years, morale was definitely low. Moses was the one who led Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea and had spoken to God time and again uh, on behalf of the Israelites. And here he was quite old and about to die. And in front of them, in front of the people of Israel was this land with all these mighty and scary people. But Moses wasn't scared 
And he told Joshua this in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. He said, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And the same is true for us today. We have a God that loves us, who protects us, who's, who just will not forsake us and is powerful enough to protect us. And we have a God who says to us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Well, today, as Richard takes us through the famous words in chapter 13 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we see truly what love means. It's a love that shines out amidst the dysfunction of the Corinthian church, where people were trying to one-up each other and trying to show off their spiritual gifts. And it's a love that marshals us to use the good things that God has given us for the sake of each other. Well, let's come now before our gentle and lowly God in prayer. Dear God, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your steadfast love toward us. And as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from us. Lord God, we place all our burdens and worries upon you today, knowing that you are able to deal with them. We pray that you will strengthen the believers in Afghanistan and work powerfully to bring your word to everyone there for the sake of your name. And we pray that you will bring peace and healing to those who are suffering amidst the COVID-induced lockdown. Let us come now before you to be refreshed and to see afresh the wonderful hope we have in your son, Jesus. And it is in the great name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, now we come to a time of family news. Uh, and as some of you know, I like numbers, and I'll be introducing today's family news with a few of them. Now, before you panic, uh, you can find all of these news items and register uh, for the events uh, on the Crossroads app or on the events page of the Crossroads website. So they should be on your screen there. Now, the first number is the number four. Our Growing Leaders training is happening across the four Mondays of September. Uh, and if you've had any questions like, have you been thinking or praying about discipling kids, youth or adults? What does Christian leadership look like? And what does teaching the Bible in Kingdom Kids, that's our kids program, Crossfire, our youth program, and a growth group, our adult Bible study groups, or in other areas look like? If you're keen to grow your own ability to handle God's word and are considering serving as a Kingdom Kids, Crossfire, growth group leader, or in other spaces, we'd love for you to come along to this training. It will start on Monday the 6th of September, and it will be happening online. We'll seek to transition this to in-person as we're able to, just pending all the restrictions and what the future will hold as well. On the final night, we hope to have the opportunity for you to meet in person with the staff to discuss further word ministry opportunities in any of these spaces, Kingdom Kids Crossfire, Growth Group Leading, uh, and more. Second number we have is the number 23. So our trivia night, has been postponed until the 23rd of September because of current restrictions. It's an uncertain time, but we are hoping to run Trivia Night and the rest of Spring Fest as well. So make sure to book in now to secure your spot and it will be first in best dressed. If you can't make it due to the change in date, we'll refund your money to you as well. So please, can I encourage you to keep inviting your friends along to the Trivia Night and we want them to know the news of Jesus and we'd still love them to get along to our other Spring Fest events as well. And we'll keep you posted on that as well. Third number we have is the number seven. In just seven days, we'll be having our third mission-minded lunch where we'll consider how we can be living 24-7 for Jesus and even consider full-time paid Christian ministry as well. Unfortunately, of course, due to current restrictions, it is a BYO lunch, but Paul Avis from Focus at UC will be speaking about what it looks like to engage in your work for the Lord and what it means to engage in the work of the Lord as well. So I'd love for you, if you're considering 
mission or what it looks like to live for Jesus to come along for lunch and Q&A next Sunday, 29th of August from 1pm. And again, BYO lunch. Fourth number is the number three, and that's the last number of the Crossroads bank account. So on your screens now, you should be able to see a couple of links to our Crossroads giving page. At Crossroads, we want to see the news of Jesus producing more and more lifelong disciples who together see the gospel reach further and deeper into Canberra and beyond. And we'd love for you to be investing in this vision. So if you've joined the Crossroads family this year or recently and haven't gotten around to setting up your giving, can I encourage you to get this in order as well and uh, do so through these links. But rather than go and make a one-off donation, can I encourage you also to prayerfully consider making a regular ongoing contribution because that will help with our budgeting um, and other things as well. Finally, we have the number one. And with lockdown affecting us all, we have a wonderful opportunity to be loving and serving each other as one big family. And a practical way we can be doing this is by helping our brothers and sisters in quarantine. We'll be using our Crossroads Classifieds Facebook group to co coordinate help. Don't know what this is? Uh, if you search Crossroads Classifieds on Facebook, you should be able to find it. If you do have a need, please write it on the classifieds. And if you're able to assist, let people know in the comment section as well below the post. So for example, if someone needs groceries or medicine delivered, they can write a request on the Crossroads Classifieds page. Uh, and after making a comment, you or I might be able to go and buy and collect these items for them as well. And please note, as the Crossroads Classifieds Facebook group is a closed group, you might need to request to join as well. Well, if you would like to hear all of this again um, or find out more detailed information, please go to the Crossroads app or to the events page on our Crossroads website as well. You'll find all of this information and how to register and more as well. So now we're going to be spending some time in prayer for one of our global partners, and this will be brought to you by our uh, growth group, one of our growth groups from Lake G. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, this week, our global partner, M is visiting us. Uh, unfortunately, because of the lockdown and being online, she can't actually share openly at church. So she's written us a short letter, which I'll read on her behalf. And then as a growth group, we will pray for her. So from M. Dear Crossroads, Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. I pray for Crossroads, that is, all of you, every week, and give thanks for your love for Jesus and your desire for Canberra and the whole world to know him. I'm so sad that I can't share with you in person today, but I'm looking forward to connecting with some of you in growth groups this week and at Crossfire on Friday. A missionary's first few years overseas are all about learning. We arrive totally ignorant of so much of local life, unsure even of how to make friends. So over the last three and a half years in North Africa, I've learned a lot. How to shop, how to pay bills, how to, to eat tangine without cutlery, how to communicate in the local Arabic. And I've even learned how to make friends and now know some wonderful women who've been very patient with my cultural ignorance and welcomed me into their lives. With those women, I've had opportunities to share about Jesus. Sadly, none of them have responded with faith but continue to vainly hope that their good deeds and Islamic prayers will be enough for God to have mercy on them. I continue to pray for them and their families, asking God to give them eyes and hearts to see and understand the glorious truth about Jesus. I'm back in Australia for six months, reconnecting with partners and spending time with friends and family. Hopefully I'll go back to North Africa in mid-January. When I return, I'll be moving to a regional town joining a small team who are sharing the gospel with villagers in the mountains. These are villages full of people who've never met a Christian and who, from birth to death, are surrounded by Islam. Please partner with me in this. Pray for me and give financially so that I can continue to share our great hope with people living in darkness. More than anything else, over the last few years, I've learned a lot about our gracious Father, who sustains us and comforts us and provides for our every need. 
My prayer is that you too will rejoice in his amazing love for us in Christ Jesus. Your sister in Christ, M. And now we're going to pray for her. Uh, let's join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you honour and praise for who you are. We are grateful to you for demonstrating your immeasurable love for us in so many ways. Essentially, uh, for offering us the gift of salvation through Jesus' ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that by accepting this most gracious gift, anyone can be reconciled with you in this life and for eternity and can be called your child. Thank you for the privilege you have given us to be part of your mission, to draw your children to yourself. Thank you for, your, for our sister M, for placing her heart, at a, her heart a passion to bring the gospel to your brothers and sisters in North Africa. We, challenged, we are challenged and encouraged by her courage in responding to the, that call. Thank you, Father, for seeing M through her first term as a missionary and for all the invaluable lessons she has learned. Thank you for the wonderful women who welcomed her into their lives, patiently helping her to navigate life in North Africa over the last three and a half years. We pray that you remind them of the good news M has been able to share with them and that their hearts will become healthy soil for the seeds of the gospel to take root and grow into faith in Jesus. We pray that you, Lord, would refresh M physically, mentally, and spiritually as she prepares for her next term back in North Africa, especially since where, since she, she will be starting life again as a newcomer in a different regional town to where she was before. We pray that the lessons and skills she has learned from her community during her first term are applicable in her new community so as to make her transition smoother. We pray most importantly that she will continue to be a light in the darkness as she proclaims the hope of the gospel. We thank you for your providence in enabling M to return to Australia for home assignment, even amidst the uncertainties brought about by the ongoing pandemic. We pray for your continued providence for her over the next six months, that she is able to reconnect with her partners and spend some quality time with family and friends. We thank you that Crossroads is able to partner with M on this mission. Help us to give more generously, both financially and by praying. Continue to encourage and challenge us through M's work to also see all our fields of endeavor as mission grounds and bring the message of the gospel wherever we find ourselves so that more and more people will come to know and accept your gracious gift of salvation and be reconciled to you. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, how good it was to spend some time together in prayer. Now we're going to be spending some time in God's Word, um, and I'll be taking us through our first reading, and that's from Leviticus chapter 19, from verse 9 to 18. Uh, and then after me, uh, one of our growth groups at City will be taking us through our subsequent reading. Uh, before we read, let's spend some time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We pray now as we come before your word that we might be able to understand it by your spirit and help us to be listening hard um, for your word. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So Leviticus chapter 19 from verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. 
you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So now we'll have the... Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi there, I'm Lara. Uh, we're going to, my growth group from the City Congregation are going to be reading 1 Corinthians 13 for you tonight. I'm just going to uh, let my growth group introduce themselves. Take it away, growth group. Hey, I'm Dan. Hey, I'm also Dan. I'm Isabella. Hey, I'm Katie. Hello, I'm Lauren. And I'm Rebecca. Thanks, growth group. So now we will get started with the reading from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, having heard from the word of God, Will you please join me in praying to our great God and Father? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do praise you for creating and governing all things from the movement of stars to the transmission of viruses. You hold your servants and all peoples in your hand and your purposes can't be thwarted. In this confidence, O oh Father, we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts to see in your word your immeasurable goodness, your incalculable love in Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so have we, as we hear your word now taught, please help me to teach it faithfully. And please fill us with your spirit to be pure and passionate for his name and in our love for one another through all circumstances, not least of which through this current pandemic, for the sake and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. On the 25th of June in 1960. Seven, a song was performed before 350 million people live on television. It had a chorus that anyone could sing. In fact, it was almost a captivating anthem that was made acceptable to the world. Can you guess what the song was? Some of you just clamoring on your screens. Others of you are shouting it out, aren't you? 
But for those of you who haven't got the faintest clue, let me give you one clue. The Beatles. No, not the Beagles. The Beatles. The song? You guessed it. All you need is love. Da, 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 da. You know that song? All you need is love. I'm not exactly what... I'm not exactly sure what they meant by love, that is the Beatles, in their song. Because the lyrics continue, nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. From the perspective of the Beatles, the so-called love game is easy. That's so true for today's world, isn't it? Love seems so easy because the word love can describe everything from hormones through to dog food. There used to be a dog food called love. And in most rom-coms, the words I love you actually mean I feel good around you. And when I fall out of love with you, it means that I don't feel good about you when I'm around you. That's all it means. But from a biblical perspective, love is far from easy. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9. The supreme and incomprehensible love of God is demonstrated by the sending of his son who died for his enemies. It's this kind of love that our Lord Jesus displayed in his life, death and resurrection. It's this kind of love that people who love Jesus as Lord will seek to display in their lives for others, other people. It's this kind of love that Paul says will characterize a truly spiritual church where Jesus is Lord. Remember, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. A church that is truly spiritual will live for Jesus as number one. They won't divide over their differences, rather they will unite in their differences like members of a body. And the manifestation of the Spirit is not about the possession of gifts, but about the purpose of the gifts, which is to demonstrate, to manifest, to, to show that Jesus is Lord by uniting his body. And that was the argument of 1 Corinthians 12 from last week, if you were watching and today we pick up the argument in verse 27 of chapter 12, as you'll see on the screen. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Do you know what he's saying? Now you, Corinthian church, are the body of Christ. Have a ponder of that for a moment. It means that each local church is not part of the body of Christ. Each local church is the body of Christ. It's not that the Ephesian church was the toe and the Philippian church was the finger and the Galatian churches were, you know, other parts of the body, the toenails, whoever they are. It's not that each church is the body of Christ. Likewise, it's not that North Canberra Baptist Church is one foot and Crossroads is the other foot and the Good Shepherd is one hand and New Life Presbyterian is the other hand and together they make up the body of Christ in Canberra. No, 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 that's not what's on view. Each local church is the body of Christ. The Corinthian church was the body and it is in each body that God appoints various gifts. What gifts? We'll have a look at chapter 12, verse 18, or verse 28, rather. Chapter 12, verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Now, I have a question for you. 
in the next 30 seconds, a real 30 seconds for you now. Here's the question coming up on the screen. In what sense is Paul ranking these gifts when he says first apostles, second prophets, third teachers and the like, right? In what sense is Paul ranking these gifts when he says those things? Your time starts now. Okay, pens down. I suspect some of you are just coming back from that cup of coffee or something like that. Well, what do you think? In what sense is he ranking these gifts? Is the ranking about status? Does it mean that apostles are more special than prophets? Well, I wonder whether, like me, you're a reverse snob, even a pseudo-Marxist when it comes to status, because we're so unimpressed with people who have impressive titles for the sake of titles. In fact, even in our own country, we don't refer to our prime minister as the prime minister, do we? We refer to him as ScoMo, right? We've already learned that we're not impressed with impressive titles. And certainly here in chapter 12, anyway, it says that the gifts are not meant to show how impressive we are. So my suspicion is it's not status that's independent of our own sense of wanting to be egalitarian in every sense of the word. But secondly, I don't think the ranking is chronological either, which is how some people understand it. That is, there were first apostles in time, then the New Testament prophets, and then after that, the teachers and the like. I don't think it's chronological because it doesn't actually fit the pattern. In Acts chapter 2, for example, the tongues came first before the prophecy. So what's on view when it comes to ranking these gifts? Well, my own view, which I hold at the moment, it may change, but at the moment my own view is that the ranking has to do with foundational importance. Foundational importance. You'll see Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Do you see? These are foundational gifts upon which the church is built, the apostles and the prophets. Without them, there is no church. So yes, they are ranked according to their foundational importance. However, not everyone possesses these gifts. Have a look at chapter 12, verse 29 and following. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly... Desire the higher gifts. When Paul asks these questions, he's expecting the answer, no, isn't he? Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. And the like. Not everyone possesses these foundational gifts. Nevertheless, these foundational gifts are still higher gifts because they are foundational and they are to be desired, he says. Why? Because they build the church in a way that the others don't. We'll see that in chapter 14 next week. But here's a sneak preview in chapter 14, verse 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Right? The higher gifts are those that most demonstrably build up the church. The higher gifts are the foundational gifts without which there is no church. Desire those gifts. Be zealous for the gifts that build up. 
However, even with that in mind, the Apostle Paul says, there is an even more excellent way to use your gifts. Even more excellent. And it's all about love. 1 Corinthians 13 begins what is arguably the most well-known part of the Bible because it is one of the most requested texts at weddings. And people who read it at weddings often do so with such theatrical tone. Have you heard that? Love is patient. Love is kind. And they'll go on and on in that way. But in chapters 12 to 14... It actually concerns the unity of the body that uses its diversity of gifts to express the lordship of Jesus. The context is not marriage, but church. And chapter 13 shows how love is the most excellent way in the life of the local church. And the first point Paul makes is that he himself is nothing without love. Check it out in verse 31b and following. And I know, sorry, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Did you pick up the personal pronoun there, the word I? Paul says that even he, he as an apostle, is nothing, nothing without love. And he's an apostle, right? One of those foundational gifts of the church. Remember, apostleship is ranked first in that list. But without love, even apostleship is useless, says Paul. But I suspect Paul is also using the word I representatively. If it applies to him as an apostle, how much more does it apply to us who are not apostles? By themselves, our gifts demonstrate nothing spiritual about us. Nothing. Without love, we are spiritually bankrupt. Spiritually nothing, says Paul. Without love, speaking in tongues is meaningless noise. Without love, prophetic powers and understanding and knowledge is worthless information. Without love, faith that moves mountains is insignificant. Without love, self-sacrifice is just hollow. And without love, martyrdom is completely useless. I mean, can you imagine a little girl dangling her feet over Lake Burley Griffin by the flags, right? And her brother runs towards her and jumps over her into Lake Billa Griffin. And, and just as he jumps over, he says, I love you, sister, and dives into the water and drowns. <laughs> is that love? That, that's martyrdom, but is that love? It's, it's kind of useless, isn't it? You know, I heard the story of a public servant who would always buy a cup of coffee for the same homeless person on his way to work every morning. And one journalist caught on to what he was doing and fascinated by his act of charity, actually caught up with him once and asked him, why do you do that? Why do you always buy a cup of coffee for this homeless person? And the reply of this public servant was, because it makes me feel good. Is that love? That's not love. That's self-satisfaction. See, without love, it's hollow. It's insignificant. It's meaningless. So how are we meant to love? What is the way of love? 
Well, verse 4 begins, Love is patient and kind. Just pause there for a moment. Love is patient and kind. Firstly, note, this is a love that is not so much defined, but described. It's described by its character. The word is doesn't make it a definition. See, I can say Richard is tall and handsome. Now, the word is doesn't make it a definition, does it? Because it's not a definition. It's just a description of Richard. And if it's referring to this Richard, it's a complete lie. A definition of this Richard is more like Richard is a Neanderthal. Right? Look at look at this lip. It's projecting out. It's a Neanderthal jaw. That's that's the it's more definitional. But even that's a description. The word is doesn't make it a definition. Right? When it says love is patient and kind, it's a description of character. Secondly, this love is not sentimental. It doesn't say love is thrilling. Love is la-la land. <laughs> love makes my liver shiver. No, it's not, not a sentimental thing. No, Paul clarifies what love is by telling us what it's not. Now, he exemplifies, actually, the inadequacy of is theology. It's well and good to say what something is, but until you say something is not, it still remains unclear. Our theological forebears understood this with the Nicene Creed regarding Jesus. Now, they wanted to say that Jesus is begotten, that he was fathered in some way in the creed. However, at the same time, they, they also stated that he was not made, right? He was begotten, not made. He was fathered in some sense, but he was not created. They wanted to say what he was not as well as what he was. He is, rather. He's not created like the Jehovah's Witnesses say that he is created in some sense. So to understand what something is, you need to understand what something is not. So to hear, see, Paul clarifies his description of love. What does it mean when he says love is patient? And kind, well, he goes on to say in the rest of verse 4, love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. You see, rather than being sentimental, love is very practical in behavior, isn't it? Patience is not merely a willingness to wait a long time or endure suffering but a willingness to endure hurt without being rude. To endure hurt without insisting on your own way or responding with irritability and resentment. And likewise, kindness is to be kind without envying, without boasting. It's not kindly congratulating the gold medalist if you were a silver medalist or a bronze medalist going, oh, that's great that you got a gold medal kind of thing, you know. No, kindness is actually generously, generously rejoicing with the one who is doing better than you. But what if there's genuine injury? What the, if there's genuine hurt? Now, if ever there was a time when we're going to get genuinely hurt or genuinely hurt others, it's during a time of heightened stress, isn't it? And if there's ever a time for sustained and serious stress, it's during lockdown. And it's stress that can easily fuel impatience and resentment and irritability and self-protection. And so if there's ever a time to love, it's now, isn't it? That means cutting each other lots of slack when people hurt us. Not jumping immediately to assumptions that they've really got it in for you. They're just, well, like all of us, a bit more stressed during this time. 
And so we're not to be resentful, especially when we get so easily hurt or easily hurt others in this environment. Now, I suspect the New International Version probably is more in keeping with the original Greek here in the New Testament, when it says, love keeps no record of wrongs. That's what it means not to be resentful, to not actually keep any record of wrongs. It doesn't keep playing back the hurt that was caused. It doesn't keep a private file of personal grievances that can be consulted and nursed whenever there is a possibility of some new offence. It doesn't play a rerun where you have the perfect comeback. Do you ever do that when you are hurt? Have it rerun in your mind and keep nursing it and nursing it and nursing it? No, love is not resentful. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love, likewise, does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And does not delight in pointing out what is wrong. This is where our Aussie culture seems to default when it comes to giving feedback. How much flack are we giving our governments everywhere all the time about everything we feel so entitled to? This is the time to give our governments, cut them a bit of slack. They're all trying their best. Sure, they're going to make foolish decisions from time to time, but so are we. However, love does rejoice with the truth. And sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Sometimes the truth can even be seen by outsiders to be immoral. But if we love Jesus as our Lord, we should rejoice in his truth. And rejoicing in his truth by acting accordingly will be loving. Someone who rejoiced in the truth that Jesus is begotten, not made, was a 4th century bishop by the name of Athanasius. Put that down somewhere if you haven't heard that name, Athanasius. But he was driven out of his church five times by the powers of the Roman Empire because of this. And 17 of his 45 years in ministry were spent in exile because he rejoiced in this truth that Jesus is begotten, not made. Can you believe it? That's inspiring for the likes of Athanasius. But what about us mere mortals or Neanderthals like me? Uh, what, do we, what do we do when it comes to rejoicing with the truth? Oh, remember that reading from Leviticus chapter 19? In verse 17, as you'll see coming up on the screen, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Hating your brother or sister involves taking vengeance, bearing a grudge against them, keeping a record of wrongs, nursing that hurt, replaying over and over again in your mind how they caused you that hurt and keeping that record. That's what it means to hate your brother or sister, says God in Leviticus 19. Whereas loving your brother or sister is to love them with the truth by, note, Reasoning frankly with them. Being truthful with them. That's love. We know the truth that people who are vaccinated are far less likely to get infected and die of COVID-19 than those who are not. So that's why there are ads and Facebook posts that rejoice with the truth of getting vaccinated. Right? Now, how much more should we rejoice in the truth that Christ's love compels us? Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live 
should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That's truth. A truth that recognizes that if Jesus has died for me, then I'm no longer to live for myself, but I'm to live for him as number one of my life. I'm to live for Jesus as my Lord. I'm to live for him so that everything about me, everything in my life revolves around him and his plans and his purposes for the world and for our church. Is Jesus number one of your life? If you're not sure, please do ask a friend about that. And ask any of the staff and the QR codes that will be available at the end of this time and check out what it is to find out who Jesus is and why he is actually Lord of your life. For if he is Lord of your life, then it makes sense to love by living no longer for ourselves, but to live for Jesus by serving Jesus. Others, loving others, so that you lose your own interests for the sake of others. That's why we read in chapter 13, verse 7, love bears all things and believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, like Jesus, we will bear all things in love, even though these all things can be all circumstances, including the pandemic that we find ourselves in. We'll still love in and through all the challenges that come with this lockdown. And we'll believe and trust all things. Uh, that's not saying that we will be gullible, but that there will be a generosity and an openness and acceptance rather than suspicious or cynicism to rejoice at wrongdoing. Now, we'll hope all things as well. When, when hopes are repeatedly disappointed, it still courageously waits, right? We'll hope against hope to serve the needs of others, even though they let us down. We'll just keep going. See, love endures in that sense. In fact, we go on to learn that love never ends. Chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. See, there is discontinuity and continuity between this age and the next age. And this is probably best understood by this diagram. See, have a look at the diagram closely. The horizontal line below in this diagram represents this age into which Jesus came. And when he died and rose again, as seen by the cross there, as represented by the first vertical line with the cross, Jesus ascended to his father's side and poured out his spirit to begin the new age to come. And the next vertical line represents his promised return to judge his enemies and take his people home. Put another way, when Jesus rose from the dead to be enthroned as the resurrected Christ, he dragged in the new age into this fallen age. He created the so-called overlap of the ages. And this is what theologians call the now but not yet. The overlap of the ages. So now we experience in part what we are yet to experience in full on the last day. So as we read, as you'll see in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The perfect comes when Jesus returns, you see. But until then, we wait. And when Jesus comes, well, gifts will pass away. But love 
never ends. It will continue on into the new age, into the new creation. Gifts will not continue, but love will continue into the new creation. There is no need for the gifts of prophecy and tongues and knowledge in the new creation. What passes away, of course, is not knowledge per se, but this particular gift of knowledge, whatever that gift is, that Paul and the Corinthians know about. For we will all have knowledge in the sense of chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully. You see, we will have knowledge, even as I've been fully known. It's knowing fully then. But the gift of knowledge now, I don't know quite what that is, but that gift will actually pass away. In other words, when that wonderful knowledge of God becomes ours, the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues and the gift of knowledge will be obsolete. As one commentator put it, when the sun rises, all other lights will go out. When the sun is blazing, the street lights are just completely superseded. That's what will happen with gifts. They will be superseded. They will go out. And Paul also compares the transient nature of gifts with the growth of a child, verse 11 of chapter 13. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Gifts, in other words, are child's play. You give them up when you grow up. Do you remember the time when you had your ideal bedroom as a child? Maybe it was fluoro pink walls or Star Wars sheets with Yoda on it or your poster of Tay-Tay or One Direction. <laughs> you look back at the time and you feel so utterly embarrassed that that's what it was like. And some of you perhaps are students now and, and they're still like that in your bedrooms because that's what you left them when you came here to study in camp. Or you go back and you think, whoa, this is what... And it's a bit embarrassing on Zoom, isn't it? So you have the blurred background or something to cover it all up. Now that you've grown up, it's a little embarrassing. No, you give up child's play when you grow up. Don Carson, who wrote a terrific book um, on 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, uh, actually recites a little story about his daughter when she was, wait for it, two or three years old. And he actually taught her how to memorize 1 Corinthians 13, would you believe? Apparently, it was over two weeks, right? He would actually read, not only 1 Corinthians 13, he would read the first paragraph of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and then the first paragraph of 1 Corinthians 13. And after doing this daily for two weeks, he dropped off the last word of each phrase and looked at his daughter, Tiffany, to see if she could fill in the blank. So he'd say, though I, and he'd look at her and she'd say, speak. Said in the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love. I'm a noisy gong. You know, can you imagine that? This little kid who understood 1 Corinthians 13. Well, she actually didn't understand it. She just memorized it. Apparently, she grabbed the Bible at one point and said, Tiffy, do it. And as you can imagine, Don Carson, his wife, actually fell off their chairs laughing when she got to the verse 11 and said, when I was a child, I thought like a child and so on and so forth. But come back to the main point of the metaphor here. Gifts are child's play, even though a child can memorize 1 Corinthians 13. But gifts are child's play. You give them up when you grow up, right? However, love never ends. Love continues into the new creation. Chapter 13, verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three but the greatest of these is love. Unlike childishness that gives way to maturity, unlike partial understanding that gives way to full understanding, love will remain. Love will continue. But is it only love? Look at chapter 13, verse 13 again. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. 
right? Faith, hope, and love abide. It's not only love that remains, but faith and hope as well. They're all eternal, permanent virtues. In what sense? Well, faith remains. I know it says faith gives way to sight, but that's not what it's being referred to here in verse 13, in my view. Faith remains because it's simply referring to trust in God. Will there ever be a time in which you stop trusting in God, even in the new creation? Now, hope is a little surprising because what we hope for will have arrived in the new creation, seeing God face to face. That is true. And yet Paul dares to say in chapter 15, verse 19, as you will see, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul expects hope to continue in the next life somehow. In what sense? Well, our hope in God, I take it, remains. Is there any sense in which we will ever stop hoping in what God has in store for us in eternity itself? I mean, in heaven, in the new creation, we don't just hang around throwing cloud balls at each other in boredom or, or shooting each other with paint clouds or something like that. No, there's going to be hope of what it is that God has in store in eternity in some sense in that it won't be boring, right? In the new creation itself, we can look forward to whatever God is in store for us. What will the bliss of eternity be like? And yet, even though faith and hope remain, what surpasses even them is love. Love and the new creation. Why? Why is love the greatest? Well, because God himself is love. Have you ever known someone so magnetically kind and gracious, so warm and generous of spirit that just a little time spent with them affects how you think or how you feel or how you behave? Someone whose very presence makes you feel better, even if only for a while? I can think of a dear Dear lady who's now in her 90s, but I knew her well in her 60s, in her 70s, when we were on beach mission together. And she was just like that. You'd be in her presence and you'd just feel better for it. They're little pictures of how God is. God is love in such a profound and potent way like this incalculably that you simply cannot know him without yourself become loving god is love as we read in 1 john 4 verse 7 to 10 beloved let us love one another for love is from god and whoever loves has been born of god and knows god and anyone who does not love does not know god because god is love in this the love of god was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, the God who is love is the same God who sent his son. God, in this specific context, refers to God the Father, who is love. But even before sending his son, we know that he was loving and begetting and delighting in his son. And so the standard for all other love relationships is God's love for his son. So what makes his love so immeasurable, so incalculable, is that he sent his son to take upon himself all the anger of God that we deserve that was turned aside from you and me unto him so that we might live. That's what propitiation means, to turn his anger aside unto Jesus instead of love, instead of us to demonstrate that love. That's love, to die for his enemy. Can you imagine people 
who are victims in Afghanistan seeking to die for the Taliban who have just entered their country. Oh, that's what Jesus did. That's an incredible love, isn't it? Losing your own interests for the interests even of your enemies. That's the kind of love that remains into heaven and outshines even faith and hope. So what will make our church like heaven? The simple answer is love. The greatest evidence that heaven has invaded our sphere, that the spirit has been poured out upon us, that we are citizens of God's kingdom that is not yet here, is God's most excellent way of love. The greatest evidence that God has actually entered our sphere in church at crossroads is that we love one another deeply from the heart, patient, kind, with the use of our gifts, not rude, not resentful, not irritable, not seeking our own way, but seeking the good of others. And there's no better time to display that love than now. Can you see why gifts without love are useless? Well, may our church at Crossroads be a heavenly church because we love one another like God so loved us. Will you pray with me? Oh, our Father and our God, we do thank you so very much for the love that you displayed in sending your son to die the death that we deserve. To rise. To sit at your right hand, to pour out his spirit. And now enable us to exercise gifts with this most excellent way of love. Father, as we will sing in a moment, we pray that we will be one in your love. And that we will display this love in acts of kindness that will be so countercultural that people will see that we are yours because of our love for one another. And may we do so into eternity itself. Loving you and loving others for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, how great was it to be reminded today of, yeah, just the wonders of God's love in Richard's talk. I think something that stood up for me was what makes our church heavenly, and that's love. And a perfect example of this is our God, our God who is love, and who uh, showed us love first by sending his one and only son, Jesus. How amazing is that? Well, as we come to our final song, We Are One, let's continue to think of ways that we can love and serve each other. You can either join with me in song, or you can reflect and pray uh, through some of the ways in which you can be loving and serving others uh, this week. After the third verse, I'll pause to pray and give thanks to God for his love. Looking forward to the day when we all sing together as one in heaven. So let's come together now in song. We are one. Sister, let me wipe your tears Brother, let me bear your fears Come on, every daughter, every son 
Let us walk in love, for we are one. Though we walk a long and broken road, we are here to bear each other's load. And forgive as you've forgiven us. Let us walk in love, for we are one. We are one in the Father's love. We are of every tribe and every tongue. We are found in the risen Son. We are bound together by His blood. Let us walk in love, for we are one. There's a love that conquers all divides. There's a love that paid the greatest price. For the battle over death is won Now alive in Christ we live as one We are one in the Father's love We are of every tribe and every tongue We are found in the risen Son we are bound together by His blood. Let us walk in love, for we are one. Let's spend some time now in prayer. Dear God, we praise You for Your unfailing love. We know that this is love, not that we first loved You, but that You first loved us and sent Your Son Jesus to die to take away our sin. Let us love each other, even as you love us, and as we ought to love you. And may we sing your praises forevermore, until the day we come before you in heaven, and are gathered together with people from all nations and all time. In the name of your glorious risen Son, we pray. Amen. On the day you come to call us home With the multitude before the throne Now with all the saints who've overcome For eternity we'll sing as one We are one in the Father's love we are of every tribe and every tongue. We are found in the risen Son. We are bound together by His blood. Let us walk in love, for we are one. We are one in the Father's love. We are of every tribe and every tongue. We are found in the risen Son. We are bound together by His blood. Let us walk in love, for we are one. Well, how wonderful is it to come together, whether in song or in prayer? What were some ways that you thought of to love and serve others this lockdown? Let's continue to encourage each other to put these into practice. Did you have any questions arising from today's talk? Well, Richard will be around for a Q&A session from 8 o'clock, and you can follow the links that pop up after the service, and I hope to see you there. Uh, so let me now conclude with these words from the end of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Friends, let's continue to encourage each other to love and serve each other. Go well. See you next week. those
to hunger with righteousness. Nations fall at His feet, yet He came and died for me. Oh, what mercy! Oh, what love! My soul, my soul. My soul magnifies the Lord My spirit, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior For He has done great things He is the reason why Holy is His name us from darkness, the light of the world. His kingdom awakens, our hope is assured. Rulers bow down to Him, yet my cross became His. Oh, what mercy. Oh, what love. My soul, my soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has done great things. He is the reason why. My soul, my soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has done great things. The Father's only Son, Jesus is His name. Jesus is His name. slain for all to see and it was my sin that held him on that tree we bow down we fall on our knees and plead forgiveness by his blood is what Faithful Lord of all, cleanse our hearts and we'll be clean, and then we'll rise. 
rises to people ransomed and redeemed. Your unjust wrath fell on your son. His cross proves the depths of your love. His empty.